Tonight's big stories. Today is the country's 125th year of independence. President Bong Marcos urged Filipinos to uphold the hard-earned freedom valiantly fought for by the country's forefathers. Marcos also reiterated his promise that the country will not lose one inch of its territory over disputed waters. And after decades of dedicating his life to public service, former AFP chief of staff and lawmaker Rodolfo Biazon has passed away. He was 88. We'll take a look back on his legacy as a statesman and his contributions to Philippine democracy. And at least 14 residents of a barangay in Pampanga, most of them children, were bitten by one rabid dog. We'll talk about preventing rabies infection later on in the program. Welcome to The Big Story. Good evening, I'm Regina Lay. I'm Gretchen Ho. And I'm Sean Yao. Right, happy Independence Day, ladies. Okay, take two. <laughs> Happy Independence Day, Happy ladies. Independence Day. Happy 125th year of independence. It which has been a rainy a day today. Mm -hmm. And of course, for President Bongbong Marcos's first uh, celebration as, as president. president. Yeah, it did not keep uh, anybody from continuing on with the Independence Day celebrations in Quirino Grandstand as well as a parade. Yes, a parade that, you know, we were just talking with our bosses and we do not remember when the last parade happened. I remembered when I was little, but then I'm not sure what Sa happened. Sa ni uh, Pangulong Maybe Rodrigo Duterte, parang wala naman, wala. ano? Pati kay, kay Pinoy. Pinoy. Maybe because mm -hmm. it's been rainy, right? It was also rainy last year, that's what I remember. Well, it, it is such rainy a almost wet. every year. Because okay, it's fair enough. I remember okay. the wreath laying as mm -hmm. the only activity done by the president, usually. Mm -hmm. And then the speeches. That's right. This time that's around, hard. there yes. was a parading of uh, new assets by the military. Well, maybe that's why they paraded it. We actually have new assets mm -hmm. to parade this time around. It was also around. a social civic parade. All right, and just like today. what we mentioned, President Marcos's first Independence Day celebration as president was marred by light rains at the Luneta and the nearby Quirino Grandstand. Now, despite the inclement weather, Marcos Jr. pushed through with the reef laying and flag raising activities over at the Rizal National Monument. The independence rights finished with a socio civic parade that Gretchen was mentioning. It lasted for over an hour. This was participated in by various government agencies and local government units in and around Metro Manila. In his speech, Marcos said that the Philippines will never again be subservient to any external force and reiterated the importance of addressing, quote, unfreedoms hounding Filipinos today. It is said that there are manifold unfreedoms prevailing in society that stand in the way of human development. These are the corrosive political and social conditions that make the nation not as free as we would like to profess and to believe, such as poverty, inadequate economic opportunities, disabling rather than enabling living conditions, inequality, and apathy. All right, now let's hear what Vice President Sara Duterte had to say on this 125th Independence Day. We have Pamela Vasquez to give us the details. Go ahead, Pam. Sean, that's right. Vice President Sara Duterte also extended a message of unity on Independence Day. In a statement, Duterte is hoping that everyone will support the education sector to free youth from the danger of joining armed movements. She also said that now is the time to express gratitude to the heroes who continue to fight for freedom from terrorism, criminality, and corruption. Duterte was not part of the celebration earlier today as she is currently in Brunei as part of her mandate as President of Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization. Sean? Thanks for that, Pam Vasquez. Well, aside from Luneta Park, the Philippine flag was also simultaneously raised across various historical locations in the country to celebrate Independence Day. House Speaker Martin Romualdez led the celebration at the Monument of Andres Bonifacio in Caloocan. In his speech, Romualdez recalled the heroism of Andres Bonifacio and other heroes who fought for the country's independence. Panahon ito para balikan din natin ang kasaysayan 
tungo sa kalayaan at matuto sa mga aral ng nakaraan. Hindi natin may lalatag ang daang tungo sa magandang kinabukasan kung hindi pag-aralan ang landas na tinahak ng mga naunang henerasyon. Meanwhile, Chief Justice Alexander Gismundo led the commemoration at Baraswain Church in Bulacan. His message was to work together and unite in order to uplift the lives of every Filipino. Kalayaan hindi lang sa mananako, kundi sa gutom, sa kahirapan, sa pangamba, sa kawalan ng katarungan. Ang kalayaan na mabuhay na masaya, na may dignidad, na may pagmamahal, may pag-asa. Executive Secretary Lucas Bersamin, meanwhile, led the simultaneous flag-raising ceremony at the Aguinaldo Shrine in Kawit, Cavite. That is where the Philippines declared its independence from Spain on June 12, 1898. Now, over in the West Philippine Sea, residents, local government officials, and soldiers on Pagasa Island sang the national anthem together while raising a giant Philippine flag. This is the largest flag ever used on Pagasa Island, measuring over 26 feet. Plans are also underway to erect a larger flagpole to permanently display the giant Philippine flag on the island. From the seas to the mountains, let's get the latest this time on Mayon Volcano. So far, around 13,000 people living near Mayon have moved to evacuation centers as ash and toxic gases spew from the crater. Mayon also continued to release lava and red hot rocks with some reaching as far below as 1,000 meters from the summit. Policemen and soldiers are now in the area to prevent residents from returning to the 6-kilometer permanent danger zone. As for the evacuees, government units have distributed food packs and other relief commodities to the centers. For now, FIVOLKS continues to monitor the volcano for any further eruption, which could force them to raise the alert level to 4. It's higher than the probability that na magkaroon ng explosive eruption na well, sana naman we're, we're hoping na hanggang dito lang ganyan lang yung behavior niya pero still uh, maganda na po yun na nag, uh, nagpa-evacuate na tayo eh. All right, here to give us the latest on the situation on the ground in Albay we have with us live via Zoom Albay Governor Greg Slagman Governor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope you are keeping safe. Um, give us the lay of the land right now. How is the situation there and have all the residents within the six-kilometer radius zone been evacuated? Yes, uh, at present, uh, there are 3,876 families that have been evacuated. And this amounts to 13,808 uh, individuals. And... Uh, as mentioned earlier uh, from your reports, uh, the FIVOX has yet to issue another advisory that would raise the alert level from three to four. So we're still on alert level three. And uh, what is mandated is the uh, evacuation of our uh, residents uh, within or inside the six kilometer radius. If and uh, when, it is raised to alert level four, it will increase to seven kilometers uh, in terms of the radius that has to be uh, followed. So uh, we have uh, one community college, uh, 13 DEP ed uh, schools, at nine uh, evacuation facilities owned by the uh, province that uh, have accommodated uh, the said number of uh, families and uh, individuals. Sir, um, itong umaga kasi nabalitaan po namin na medyo nagsisiksikan po sa evacuation centers. Families are complaining of the tight spaces. What is gov local government doing to solve this problem? Are you looking to opening up more centers? Well, um, I just uh, issued an executive order wherein uh, there would be a, a disaster help desk uh, in each uh, station that will be stationed in each uh, uh, in all evacuation centers to make sure that there are uh, measures that would uh, be implemented uh, because the physical uh, arrangement in our evacuation centers uh, need to be reassessed. Uh, I think the distance uh, uh, between uh, tents uh, is not uh, uh, pursuant to what the protocols dictate. 
So we have to make sure that uh, lo the local government units, uh, they have been doing a great job, really. Uh, but I think uh, the province can come in uh, and uh, offer some uh, help uh, in making sure that protocols, uh, safety and health protocols are being uh, uh, implemented in said evacuation centers. All right, Governor Grex, moving forward, we all know Mayon uh, erupts every few years. Moving forward, are there any plans to permanently relocate people or families outside of the six-kilometer permanent danger zone? Yeah, Sean, uh, that's a very uh, good question because earlier today, I mean, um, uh, I mean, uh, early this afternoon, uh, we had a very uh, robust uh, discussion with the uh, mayors as well as with the SILG. Uh, uh, ben Her Abalos, uh, with respect to uh, making sure that uh, this would not be a perennial problem that uh, Albayanos have to face. And I think it's uh, well and good because uh, it's an idea that must be uh, really seriously uh, put to the table. Otherwise, we would be uh, beset by the same kind of problems every year. Uh, Sean, it's not only... Uh, uh, possible by an activity or uh, that would require uh, the uh, preemptive mandatory uh, re, uh, evacuation of our residents. Uh, it, it would can well be typhoons, uh, earthquakes, etc., and other natural calamities. And we are known to be one of the provinces that is uh, uh, always visited by such. So I think uh, after uh, things normalize, there should be a summit of sorts within the Disud as well as uh, the Department of Agrarian Reform should come in so that the policy would be in place to permanently resettle uh, uh, residents of barangays that are living in these uh, danger zones. Yeah. All right, we're <clears throat> going to have to leave it there for now. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll buy Governor Greg Slugman. Do stay safe out there. And here's a little bit of sad news. Tributes continue to pour in for the late AFP chief and veteran lawmaker Rodolfo Biazon, who died today at 88. His son, Montenlupa City Mayor Rufi Biazon, said that the former senator caught pneumonia twice this year and has been in hospital. The late statesman was also diagnosed with lung cancer last year. Rodolfo Biazon served as chief of staff of the armed forces during the Coric Aquino administration. He was also elected senator in 1992 and again in 1980 or 1998, where he served for two terms until 2010. His last government post was from 2010 to 2016 as Muntin Lupa representative. A necrological service for the late Pong Biazon is scheduled for June 19. Again, our prayers are with the Biazon family. And here to talk to us about the former AFP chief's life and legacy, we have with us One News Defense Editor Manny Mogato. Good evening, Sir Manny. Hi, good evening. Well, um, Rodolfo Biazon was described as a soldier, a statesman, a defender of democracy. He was also an outspoken soldier. Yes. What for you would be his most remarkable achievement or role in Philippine government? You know, uh, General Biazon was the only Navy officer and a Marine General who became Chief of Staff. Mm -hmm. Yes, usually it comes from nun. the Army, right? Oh, because usually uh, the Chief of Staff comes from the Army and mm. the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So he's the only Navy officer. And it, is, it was a reward uh, for his role in the 1989 coup attempt. Uh, he was the commander of the National, uh, National Capital Region Defense Command. And uh, he defended Camp Aguinaldo. So the rebel soldiers were able to breach the gate using heavy tanks. You know? And Biason's men, uh, most of them were cooks mm -hmm. and band members because... Are literal cooks? Yes, oh, because... Okay. <laughs> yes, because, because the Marines that were under him joined the rebel forces. Mm -hmm. you know? So his troops, his uh, soldiers, were able to stop the tanks by firing a uh, howitzer mm -hmm. uh, so but you know I, I first met General Biason in 1987 uh, when I saw him I was so terrified why <laughs> he was stern serious mm -hmm. he did not smile mm -hmm. no? and he was eating his meal 
No? At that time, I went to Baguio City because he was the superintendent of the PMA. There was a bombing incident no, before the graduation where President Cory Aquino was supposed to attend. And that bomb, I think, prematurely uh, went off mm. and four people died. So he was investigating it. So I, I was the first reporter to went there in Baguio mm -hmm. City. So I was afraid. <laughs> but it was also I did, that, that was my question as well. What's, what was it like covering him? Was, yeah, but was it always scary or, or naging friendly? Na only, the, only, only the looks, no? Oh, because he's military man. Yes, <laughs> yes. But yeah. pero, pero after his meal, he, he talked to me. And he was friendly and uh, he, he made me relax. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that was the first meeting I had. And later, when he was in Manila and he was... Uh, the NCR commander, uh, he always tells stories. Mm -hmm. no? His exploits, mm -mm. his experience. Mm -mm. And I remember uh, one story uh, he always narrated to us. No? It was uh, his childhood. Mm. Because he grew up in uh, Pasay. Malapit sa Kuli Kuli. You know what is Kuli Kuli? To be honest, no. Can you remember sure. with us? What? Walang no, it's the Red Light diba? District. Ah, oh, okay. Ah, okay. Alam ko na. Ano okay, pa yun hanggang ngayon? Alam ko na yung tupo niya tungkol doon. Eh, nag-adala doon siya mga planggana. Ah. Mm -hmm. Doon sa mga brothels. Para sa... Ah. Oh, kasi ano siya, he, he was still... Uh, yun ang trabaho niya. Mm, Noon. No. Eh, he did so many odd jobs during his uh, mm. younger days. And uh, luckily, uh, he passed the PMA exam and went there. But he attended first sa Piati University. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, when he was accepted sa PMA, he was not actually a brilliant uh, student. You no, know? In fact, he failed this smart class. <laughs> so he was turned back. Uh, he had an extra year. You know? And he graduated in 1961 at the tail end of his class. But, but then he managed, he managed to become, uh, I think, the first PMA graduate to be in the Senate, to become a senator. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And uh, how was he like as a lawmaker after his defense career was over? He went into the legislation or the legislature. Uh, he was first senator and then congressman. How did he do? Well, as senator, uh, twice, no? Mm -hmm. uh, for 12 years, Biason is a very decent legislator, very honest and very uh, hardworking. No? Uh, the bills he had uh, uh, sponsored includes the modernization bill of the military in 1995. No? So he was actually uh, very instrumental in upgrading our military capability because at that time in 1992, when the Americans left, we had nothing. We were completely naked. <laughs> so, Biason, as a former chief of staff, saw to it that uh, there will be a bill mm -hmm. that will give the military funding. So, the bill, I think, uh, authorized 150 billion in 1995. Sino po sa mga anak niya yung nagmana sa kanya? Uh, si Rufi. <laughs> Eh, siya lang naman na yung nag-iisang nasa politika. Pero kumpara sa, kumpara sa mga lawmakers ngayon, how, how was he? What is your you know, assessment of him? Eh, si, si Del Biasor ay nag-aaral. No? Talagang, ano siya eh, uh, no nonsense. No? Mm -hmm. Unlike yung, uh, oh, natansi, <laughs> sabihin yung ano, yung mga na, nakaupo. <laughs> Manny, just uh, very quickly, I think we have to talk about this very important for our younger viewers, right? Mm -hmm. Mga uh, uh, age ni Gretchen. Yes. Uh, and below. Uh, what, and below. <laughs> what was his contribution to EDSA? I think that's that. that Yun that ang hindi ko sigurado. Kasi pag sinabi at sundal, it could be here, it could be there. Mm. Uh, you know, was he? He's you know, part of the Navy. He's part Biasun of the Navy. was in Dabao during that time. Mm. He was a Marine commander. No? At that time, when the people... Uh, were angry and uh, cursing the military for their abuses, Biasan was different. He won the hearts of the people mm. in Davao. He visited schools, mm -mm. visited communities, 
He was very friendly to the media. So, kaibigan siya, naka ng lahat, no? So, when EDSA happened, he was there. But, I think he joined General Ramos. Uh, dun sa EDSA. So, he didn't, his loyalty is not for the former dictator. Uh, probably why you also gained a crucial role in the Cory administration. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing us your insights and memories yes. uh -oh, with uh, uh, the former AFP Chief of Staff, Rodolfo Biazon. Again, our sympathies are with the family. Thank you for joining us, One Thank News you. Defense Editor, Manny Mogato. We're going to pause for a quick break now, but up next, cases of rabies have slightly gone up this year, prompting calls for pet owners to be more responsible. That and more when the big story returns. Keep it here on One News. You're watching The Big Story here on One News. Here's a reminder to always be careful around stray animals. A rabid dog in San Fernando, Pampanga bit at least 14 individuals, most of them children, in Barangay Kalulut. One of the victims is a 40-year-old woman who was attacked and was bitten on the face by the dog while she was manning her store. Another victim is this 8-year-old child who was also bitten on the face. That resulted in injuries on his cheeks, nose, and eyes. All 14 victims were immediately rushed to the hospital and given anti-rabies shots. The dog was tracked down and beaten to death by fearful residents. When checked by the city veterinarian, it was confirmed that the dog was positive for rabies. Data from the Health Department's Epidemiology Bureau shows that cases of rabies slightly increased this year to 136 from 128 in 2022. The Department of Health reminds people who have been bitten by rabid dogs to immediately wash the wound with soap and water and rush to the nearest hospital or animal bite center. Alright, so pag kinagat kayo ng dog, no, uh, hindi matik na bibigyan kayo ng rabies shots. And like, uh, it's a bit more complicated than getting a tetanus mm -hmm. shot, for example. It's a series, It's isn't a it? series. It's, it's, and it's five also, or six shots. Yeah, so kunyari, nasa arm siya, they will actually parang surround the wound with a series of shots. And then they'll tell you when the next schedule is. It's actually really Medyo expensive. Mahal yun. Medyo mahal na yun. Medyo mahal na yun. Pero may libre dun yata siya. May... So may mga health and animal bite center. Lato may mga animal bite center. Yung ABC. Question, Sean. Um, does that mean I have to, you know, um, stay away from all the ASCAs? Ano bang, paano ba iiwasan yung ganyan? Parang based on, uh, based on what I know, no? yung mga aso na infected nga with rabies, uh, parang they kind of act crazy. rabid talaga. Oh, oh, oh. So may, uh, parang some sort of uh, weird behavior. Yung parang, tinatawag nila sa Tagalog, di ba, asong ulol. Uh, oh. Kasi nga parang medyo na nawiwindang yung mga dogs so they act a little bit nuts. So kung ganun na, stay away stay for away. sure. Oh. But, uh, right. but I don't think there is a surefire way of knowing mm -hmm. just by looking Luck, at the yeah. dog. It's right? a bit, it's and a bit so hard. it's on us to take precautions. Um, and of course, if you get bitten, whether the dog is uh, rabid or not, 
you, you need should to get, get checked. checked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure. Even if fully you vaccinated. You need to get dog. checked. Correct. You need to get a good checked. reminder for everyone. Right. All right. We're going to pause for a quick break. After that, an SWS survey shows that Vice President Sara Duterte is the top pick as the successor of President Bongbong Marcos in 2028. The details on that survey when the big story returns. Keep it here on One News. You are still watching the big story here on One News. What else do we have tonight, girls? We have an mm -hmm. SWS survey. Mm -hmm. I survey had to. Now. <laughs> I, I paused because it's just 2023. Oh, yes. And we're going to talk about surveys a year ago. Oh. And now we're back because there is a latest survey. Um, this one looking at 2020, 2028 uh, uh, candidates, potential candidates, right? So one polling firm, this is. SWS has started listing down p potential bets or tracking potential bets to be more precise. Uh, in that survey, the social weather stations found that Vice President Sara Duterte emerged as the top choice to succeed President Bongbong -Bong Marcos in 2028. Coming in at a far second is Senator Rafi Tulfo and former Vice President Lenny Robredo. The commissioned survey was conducted last April with 1,200 respondents. It also tallied the most preferred candidates for the senator. Topping the survey's boxing legend and former Senator Manny Pacquiao, followed by Senator Bong Revilla and former Senate President Tito Soto. Also in the top five are Senators Bong Go and former Senate President and business tycoon Manny Villar. Incumbent Senators Bato De La Rosa and Amy Marcos also made it to the survey's top 12, along with former DSWD Secretary Erwin Tulfo. Rounding up the top 12 preferred senators are former President Rodrigo Duterte, former Senator Ping Lacson, and Senator Pia Cayetano. I was looking for House Speaker Martin Romualdez, but he he is uh, not polling not for yet now. There. It for is now. early, but Maybe he, he is wants not to polling. skip the Senate. Oh. Sino kaya na commission na? Oh, it's a guy named Arnel T from the LPGMA party oh. list. Do we know for sure that's the same guy, the party list representative? It's not just another Arnel T. Na, I think it, they pr okay. they pretty much uh, you know the, okay, disclose so it, that. So it's him. Yes. It's him that commissioned this. Okay, well, well, there's one more thing before we go. Our big picture for tonight: not a volcano, but an artwork that has been making headlines in the past days. Well, perhaps you've already caught this on your timelines. It is one Luna's Jimen o Jimene. The painting was last seen over a century ago, at the time of Luna's death back in 1899. The painting has been dubbed as the Holy Grail of Philippine art and was eventually found in the collection of a family in Europe who later agreed to sell it and eventually was acquired by an art collector in 2014. After that, the painting had been stored and kept for the last nine years until it was unveiled at the Ayala Museum just in time for the 125th anniversary of Philippine independence today and libre yung uh, 
and entrance, entrance to the museum today. which I hope a lot of people took advantage. And this was the painting that won in Paris in yes, the Olympics it, of yeah. painters, right? Yes, it's called uh, the Exposition Un something like that. Universal. Like Universal. Sorry, hindi ako marunong mag-run. Many, 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 many years oh, yeah. ago. So, exactly. So it's priceless. Yes. priceless. But and I am say that really it's curious as to how much it costs the private collector to purchase it back maybe from you Europe. We'll find declare. out in the coming exactly. days. Exactly. Hindi na declare. Not. Hindi na siguro. Well, it's the declare. mystery though that makes it priceless. But you know, this is a great one. I mean, usually it's all about the spolarium when it comes to one Luna. But I per personally want to see this painting because it's a bit different uh -oh. from his usual About work. married life, right? Yeah. Mar weddings. Yes. Also before he killed his wife, Paspardo de Tavera. And during, this was during before their honeymoon. Luna, during before the honeymoon. Luna killed oh, the wife, that's yeah. right. This was during their honeymoon, painted during the honeymoon. So again, it's at the Ayala Museum until the end of this year. So lots of time to go see it. But unfortunately, that's it for the show tonight. We are One News, all sides, all the time. Thanks for tuning in and good night.